Hey, it's Mike here, and today, adaptogens. What are they? Do they work? Are they worth the money? Because the marketing can be pretty slick. First thing, you're just walking by the supplement aisle. Next thing you know, you just downed several large capsules, and you're wondering, are these taking effect? Does my hand always look like that? In particular, we're gonna look at some of the most popular adaptogens and the research on them in detail, as well as the general concept of adaptogens. But I wanna say, this video was requested a little over a week ago, so thank you for the request and keep the request coming so I know what you guys want. So prepare for quite a bit of science in this video, but also to keep it light and by some of the requests I was reading recently, you want more skits, apparently, so I will bring my friend along in this journey. So first off, what is an adaptogen? Well, according to Uncle Cletus, Yeah, that's when I drink so much gin, I can't get drunk no more. Adaptogen. No, Cletus, that is entirely wrong. Agree to disagree, fancy YouTuber. The actual definition from Oxford Languages is, quote, In herbal medicine, a natural substance considered to help the body adapt to stress and to exert a normalizing effect upon bodily processes. I've been wondering, is this limited to plants? Well, it appears that it's plants, plant extracts, as well as certain fungi and their extracts as well. Here are a few from this book on the topic. Some are familiar, things like ginseng and ashwagandha and cordyceps, which is a mushroom, and holy basil. And we'll cover some of these in detail. The rest, uh, we just won't have time. And adaptogens actually have quite an interesting history. We're talking about the mid-1900s, Soviet Union, people trying to figure out how to utilize ancient plant medicine to help with things like night vision, because they heard some berry tonic helps with night vision, and so forth. Now, the general concept of adaptogens was introduced by Dr. Nikolai Lazar a rev who was really all about just reducing the stress response and this chart really sums it up you're essentially trying to blunt that peak of stress so that you possibly don't have that later fatigue or crash afterwards and you just remain even and able to function well. Since then, this concept entered the commercial sphere and led to a ton of products like one you might have heard of, the LA-based company Moon Juice. I make my own Moon Juice out back. I think it's why I'm going blind. Oh. Cletus, I believe you're talking about moonshine. Completely different. No, this is a line of adaptogens that has been super popular. According to Vox, when they introduced a new product, it sold out and quote, people were calling shops and driving to stores just to find one in stock. So obviously this is super popular and worth investigating. And right off the bat, there's a big issue with this entire industry, and that is that it pretty much encompasses all of modern herbal medicine because the definition of stress is so wide. Although a lot of people are just thinking about emotional stress. We all know that various plants have legitimate, amazing benefits, but when we're talking about all plants and all of the claims that any of these money hungry companies could be making, we have a bit of an issue, especially if they're marketed to people that are desperate to heal and also especially an alternative health market that might not be so focused on the scientific evidence. Like Cletus, only he doesn't care about science or his health, right Cletus? Jolene, Jolene, let's get drunk lean. Yeah, I'm starting my own YouTube channel. Yeet it with Cletus. Subscribe. Did he just say drunk lean? I am sorry, Dolly Parton. But the point is here, zooming out at the entire alternative health sphere, we have to keep in mind that we're talking about everything from legitimate high antioxidant plants to, although this isn't an adaptogen, those pangolin scales, which are basically fingernails ground up in hopes of treating male sexual failures. And that unfortunately has led to pangolins being the most trafficked mammal in the world. The point is, we gotta keep it science-based and level-headed. So let's get to the big question, do adaptogens work? Again, we're talking about a generalized question of really, do plants and perhaps some fungi actually work to relieve some degree of stress? And that brings me to the king of lowering stress in the adaptogen sphere, and that is ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is a nightshade plant out of Southern India that literally translates to horse smell. Sounds nice. Now, ashwagandha has been used for 5,000 years. This is the root that people use to make an extract. And now when we're looking for science that is legitimate on this, we're talking about, of course, human trials, in particular, randomized, controlled, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials. And so that means that 
the subjects weren't pre-picked so that they would have better results in the ashwagandha group. It's blinded so that the designers of the study aren't getting to count the results and insert any bias. And we have placebo there because people are definitely affected by suggestibility. You know, the other group has a dummy pill. You get the whole idea. Anyway, let's look at some of the research. We have this 2012 randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial out of India, which claims no conflict of interest. They gave people either a 300 milligram extract of ashwagandha or a placebo, and they say that it reduced stress scores at 60 days as well as cortisol levels compared to that placebo, all with no increase in adverse effects. Next up, we have this 2019 randomized control trial that used some standardized stress scores that I've talked about before, like the depression, anxiety, stress score. They did 250 milligrams for 60 days, and the results are, there was a 40% reduction in the Hamilton anxiety rating scale, but the placebo also did pretty well with a 20% reduction. However, that depression, anxiety, stress scale was 30% lower with ashwagandha, but the placebo group did not have a statistically significant change. End quote. Ashwagandha intake was also associated with greater reductions in morning cortisol. In fact, a 20% drop when there was no change in the placebo group. And of course, cortisol is that stress hormone. Pretty much all of us want a lower level unless you have something like Addison's disease where you're not making enough because obviously your body needs some. And in addition, here's a side effect I didn't expect. They found a 10% increase in testosterone in men but this actually does make sense because cortisol and testosterone both have the same precursor, both do, which means that if you are eating up that precursor with cortisol, then you're basically eating up testosterone fuel. So lower cortisol, you could potentially increase testosterone. And moving on, there's an even higher quality study where you basically do that randomized control trial and then you switch the placebo and the intervention or ashwagandha group at perhaps eight weeks like the study did. So you go along with the ashwagandha, the placebo, and then you switch. And that way, if there was any time sensitive effect, you're controlling for that as well. This 2018 study did just that. Unfortunately, the study didn't really look directly at anxiety. It looked at some mood state things, but those didn't actually change. However, there was not a statistically significant dip in cortisol. Now, there's a little one, but it wasn't quite enough. However, the testosterone increase for whatever reason was 15% statistically significant, so interesting stuff. It's also nice to see that this one, unlike some of these other studies we've been looking at, was directly funded by an herb company, but they didn't see all the results they wanted, so you know it was some good science. Finally, this randomized control trial found good stress and anxiety score improvements at 250 milligrams or 600 milligram doses, with 600 doing a little, little bit better, but at 600, we have to ask, what is too much? So about safety in general, this brings us to this paper where we have a case series, different case reports of liver damage from ashwagandha, but they were all up between 450 and 1,350 milligrams a day, so perhaps going over 400 is not a good idea. And one question we should always be asking with these various herbs is, are they safe? Who are they safe for? And with ashwagandha, we really don't have that much more than people taking it for a long time and anecdotally being okay. And this study, which really only looked at two months saying that it was safe. So thinking about taking it long-term is another thing. And also many have advised against taking it for breastfeeding or pregnant women because of the potentially negative effects there. So at this point, it's pretty clear that ashwagandha is having some positive effect here. How great is debatable, but in two out of three of these randomized control trials, we're seeing a lowering in cortisol and you know, pretty much across the board, we're seeing lower anxiety scores. So that's good. The question is, how would this possibly work? And that brings me to what is called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. That's a lot. Way oversimplified. This is just talking about the connection between three different parts of your body, the hypothalamus in your brain, the pituitary gland and the adrenal gland. So we're talking about how you respond to stress. And again, to keep it simple, it's really that you have a stress input and your brain, your hypothalamus, creates a cascade of hormones, which your pituitary gland and your adrenal glands respond to eventually creating cortisol. And then once your cortisol is high, it will downregulate it. Back to this particular study, they say, quote, first ashwagandha may have an attenuating effect on the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis activity. In other words, there are phytochemicals in ashwagandha that appear to just downregulate the activity of that stress response. But as we move on to other adaptogens in general, we have to be careful because just because 
this one particular claim of one adaptogen has some legitimacy to it. And I could even argue that these aren't even the highest quality journals, so you could take it with a grain of salt as well. But to go and say, yes, all adaptogens are legit or adaptogens as a group are legit is not quite right. Now, there are probably bogus claims surrounding every single adaptogen. And again, looking to this list, that's a lot of them. Let's just do three of the more popular adaptogens here. I'd love to talk about Amla. You know I love it. You can check out nutritionfacts.org. It would need its own video here. But instead, we're gonna focus on cordyceps, ginseng, and holy basil or tulsi, starting with ginseng. I love ginseng. It's when you drink gin and then you sing. Drunk lane, drunk lane. Okay, stop, stop, we get it. You and the gin today, Cletus. Anyway, let's move on to the main claim for ginseng, which is that it increases cognitive performance. We'll cover a couple as well, but let's look to the data. Obviously, increased cognitive performance would be good if you're facing stress, but looking to this 2010 review, they say, currently there's a lack of convincing evidence to show cognitive enhancing benefit of Panax ginseng in healthy participants. In other words, they needed more randomized control trials and Panax ginseng is also just known as Eastern ginseng, Asian ginseng, a few other names. But since then, we have more research. This 2019 randomized control trial found that it helped with the recall of complex figures like this one. And quote, these results suggest that Panax ginseng has a cognitive enhancing effect. Imagine seeing that and then having to draw it from memory. That is very complicated. Oh, what, Cle Cletus, you did it? I fixed it. His name is Turb, Defender of America. Beautiful. You're basically Picasso. Anyway, another newer randomized control trial is this one from 2018. Looked at older Koreans with mild cognitive impairment. They showed a better dementia score after not two, not four, but five or more years of taking ginseng after controlling for a ton of factors. And this 2012 randomized control trial looked at reaction times of young, healthy people given 4.5 grams of ginseng for two weeks. And they found that yes, they were actually faster. They measured increased reaction times, but you know, it is the journal of ginseng research. So, you know, make your own conclusions. Now, another area that can have a lot of iffy claims is erectile dysfunction, but we actually have a systematic review on erectile dysfunction and ginseng, this one that looked at six randomized control trials which had placebos as well. And they found that, yeah, it could help a bit with ED. However, they say the methodology to a lot of these was mediocre and the sample sizes were small, so they need better data. Finally, to tie ginseng up, we have another systematic review which says some pretty promising stuff. They say, quote, we found strong evidence of a positive effect of ginseng on glucose metabolism, psychomotor function, and pulmonary disease, whereas evidence suggests that ginseng is not effective at enhancing physical performance performance. So in summary, ginseng falls short on some of the claims, but hey, there's some pretty good data that we're seeing at least some small improvements in certain areas. So for those that can afford it or are elderly, uh, yeah, not bad. Next, let's jump out of the plant realm for cordyceps, which is fungi, and it is from traditional Chinese medicine. Its name is Dongchang Xia Chao, which translates directly to nature's Cheeto, as you can see right there. Just pluck them out of the ground. Kidding, it's something to do with caterpillars, but yes, if you have a good memory, this is the same genus of fungi that involves mind-controlling ants to walk up to a high point until their head explodes with spores. Fun stuff. It, like virtually every adaptogen, is marketed to lower stress, as you can see on this Amazon listing. But studies on cordyceps and stress are massively lacking, especially when compared to ashwagandha. I mean, we have this one, which was half cordyceps, half some random root fungi, which appeared to have an anti-anxiety effect in rats. So yeah, looking around, the human data is completely lacking in this area. So perhaps this is a bit of a red herring. We shouldn't be focusing on anxiety and cordyceps. If there's something else I'm more impressed with, it is in the realm of immunity from this randomized control trial. Cordyceps extract increased natural killer cell activity by 38%. My mom always said I'm a natural born killer. That's why I can never be vegan. I mean, look at these canines. Sorry, I got a conditioner. I can't rotate my face. <laughs> Actually, Cletus, those are, those are pretty flat. Not as flat as the earth <laughs> or your wife. Take that. <laughs> I'm tough. 
That's it, Cletus. You're done for the day. You have no place in a scientific video. Moving on. But natural killer cell boosting is obviously really good. And from this study, we're talking about it being a natural defense against cancer. Very important. But we don't need to go and say it cures cancer. Let's just back it all up. What it's worth, the trial also deemed it safe at eight weeks. But of course, we have a lack of longer data in humans. Another one that I just wouldn't expect was exercise performance from this randomized control trial. We see that, quote, these findings support the belief held in China that it could improve oxygen uptake or aerobic capacity and ventilation function and resistance to fatigue of elderly people in exercise. All right, now let's move on to Tulsi or Holy Basil. Looking to Yoga Journal, they say that it lowers stress and then cortisol levels as well. So let's take a look at this. Well, this review did a really good job of combining a ton of various studies, what type of studies there were and their effects. In the realm of stress or anxiety, we had a few studies, one randomized control trial of 150 people showing lower stress symptoms, other ones showing a little bit lower anxiety, but nothing about cortisol levels to my knowledge from looking through the literature. So, you know, claims can be a little bit iffy there, but this is just a very healthy, safe plant. I mean, it's a type of mint and there are a ton of other studies in here showing great benefits, well done studies showing lower blood glucose, some lower lipids, some lower blood pressure, promising stuff. Now, if you're curious about any of the other ones that I haven't covered, absolutely, if you're up for it, take a look through PubMed, see if they're quality randomized control trials on not just the adaptogen you're looking at, but the claim that is being made. And if you can find some credible expert opinion on that, all the power to you. Also, of course, you might wanna check with your doctor about going on any of these different things because they really are medicines. And of course, these are just supplements and the FDA has completely failed to properly regulate supplements in the United States. So, you know, you have to be thinking about finding trustworthy companies and so forth. So <laughs> that's another fun part of adaptogens. And finally, a lot of the benefits of these adaptogens like Tulsi, for example, are probably just directly related to their antioxidant count. Yeah, maybe some of them have particular phytochemical effects on other things, but just having a stressful lifestyle with not enough sleep and a horrible stressful job, a little herbal pill of plants or maybe some fungi is probably not gonna fix that issue. You'd be better off, you know, if you are so able to improve your lifestyle. And of course, just eating a whole food plant-based diet is gonna be slamming down the antioxidants anyway and getting a lot of those benefits, especially in the realm of lipids and antioxidants. Because when we're talking about stress, Oxidative stress is the main driver of disease and aging. So if you can lower that, you're gonna be doing better. In the end, adaptogens just represent a wide open modern field of herbal supplements. And that means you're gonna have snake oil salesmen making a ton of claims, as well as some legitimate claims for certain plants that actually have real effects. So the hard part is parsing that out when the rule of the industry is every plant is good for everything, give me your money. But looking to things like ashwagandha and stress, we're seeing promising things there, even in the future, I'd love to see what the data says. And then cordyceps and Tulsi and that ginseng all have their own unique benefits, but they all fall short on other claims as well. So again, keep it level-headed. Finally, a lot of the adaptogen claims center around adrenal fatigue, which is, hotly debated and is lacking certain scientific validity. So if you want me to do a video on that, I will. Anyway, that's it for today. Feel free to like and subscribe, notification bell, all that good stuff. And let me know, have you taken any adaptogens? Do you have any benefits, weird side effects, hallucinations from random lead exposure? <laughs> I don't want to fear monger, but that's it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.